This is a production of Cornell University. Well, it's always awesome to come, come here because there's so many plant biologists. You know, I exist in an environment where I'm usually talking to people with an MD rather than a PH degree. Um, so today um, I'm gonna give some real botany about maize anthers, and then we're gonna see how the, a new class of small RNAs called fazi RNAs influenced anther development. Um, so first I wanna tell you how to build an anther. So in maize, uh, there are th three floret primordia, and these uh, little bumps are gonna be the stamens. Um, and these stamen initials basically use up most of the meristem. And there's cells derived from the L1 layer of the meristem and from both of the L2 layers of the monocot meristem. And there's about 100 cells at the beginning in each of these stamen initials. And what's really remarkable to me is that nine days later at the start of meiosis, you've built each anther into this four lobe structure subtended by a filament, which contains the vascular column, which proceeds up through the center of each anther. And there's now about 50,000 cells. So the pace of cell division in anthers is cell division about every eight hours, which is faster than mammalian cells in tissue culture. And also there's patterning. So from these uh, meristem derived layers within each lobe, we end up with an epidermis from the L1 and four cell types from this um, sub epidermal layer, the endothesium, which is colored green because it actually has chloroplasts the middle layer of more or less unknown function, the tapetal cells, which are nutritive uh, cells for the uh, archosporial, then pollen mother cells and myocytes, and later the microgametophytes. So we need to have a fast pace of cell division. But the first question we really asked was, where do the cell types, how do you get started making an anther? Um, and the uh, old model, was that there was a primary large cell called the hypodermal cell. So this is kind of borrowed from fern reproduction and that this giant layer two cell would divide to make a somatic cell to the exterior and an archosporial, a premiotic cell to the interior. And th this is actually copied from my undergraduate botany notes. It made no sense to me because the next drawing the teacher made was this, where we have a ring of soma around that central reproductive cell. And that just doesn't seem very likely. And so um, rather than using transverse sections, which everyone had done up, up to that point, we switched to using confocal microscopy so we could make a more uh, robust uh, description of what was going on. And in the early anther, here's the incipient four lobes. When you do it by confocal, you can never find the giant cell. But in this one transverse image from the confocal, probably everyone can pick out a cell that looks bigger. But when you actually do all the volumes, there is no giant cell. Instead, what happens is there's continual division, kind of in any plane. Now we're looking at a longitudinal view of a, a, a small anther. And until there's cells that only have L2 D neighbors. So before that, every L2D cell touched an epi a presumptive epidermal cell, but this white dot shows you a cell that is completely surrounded now by L2D cells. And that event, which you can image in, in any view, uh, combined with um, a specific glutaridoxin called MISCA1, and I'll tell you later, hypoxia, which is transduced through this glutaridoxin causes cells like this to greatly enlarge and become the archosporial cells. So the first type of cell that's specified in an anther lobe is actually the premiotic cell, the archosporial cell. And these cells um, then secrete a small protein ligand called MAC1 that causes the differentiation of the soma. So there isn't a special hypodermal cell at the beginning. There's a sequence of events that results in specification. And that process takes approximately a day. 
to make a column of archospor archosporial cells um, down the length of the anther. And this also solves an old uh, question in, in flowering plant biology. In the hypodermal cell model, all of the pollen grains from one lobe would have had one progenitor cell. So in maize, at least, there's 10 to 12 of these progenitors. Now, the anther is growing quickly at this point, and that occurs by, primarily by anticlinal divisions that add length and girth to the anther. But an extremely important job of these archosporial cells is to secrete MAC1, and that causes the L2D neighbor, the cell that's just subepidermal, to undergo a periclinal division, setting up the endothesium, which is the layer adjacent to the epidermis, and a, a subepidermal cell called the secondary parietal cell. This cell will later divide periclinally to make the middle layer in the tapetum. So one of our discoveries after kind of figuring out the sequence of events in ontogeny was that environmental conditions actually trigger the specification of that archosporial cell and its hypoxia is the environmental trigger. So this was uh, not quite a guess. The graduate student involved, Tim Kelleher, had done a lot of um, RNA analysis, transcriptome analysis, and in the early days of that, let's go back to 2010 or so, what you ended up with was huge piles of data and no insight. But what paid off was a long, long time ago, I had worked on hypoxic fruits. And when I looked at the transcriptome of these very immature anthers, I saw all the signature that I had seen in, in young root tissue that was exposed to excess water. So we used an oxygen electrode that's contained inside this 26 gauge needle to measure the amount of oxygen in the airspace around the developing tassel. So right when this specification event occurs, the column of air that's inside the whirl of maize leaves out here near the surface, it's close to ambient. It goes down, down, down because the young leaves are not photosynthetic. They're living off respiration. They're sucking the air, the oxygen out of this air. And so around the tassel, it's down at 1.4% oxygen for about three days. And that's enough to cause the specification of that column of archosporial cells. And we went on to do experimental tests of that um, by using uh, tiny needles or hoses threaded down the column of air. And we attached the hoses to either an oxygen tank or a nitrogen tank. So we could add lots of extra oxygen or purge it all out with nitrogen, making it super hypoxic. And this is kind of a complicated slide, but the punchline is that if you use nitrogen, that is make it more hypoxic, you get precocious and extra archosporial cells. In fact, violating one of the fundamentals of botany, we could convert epidermal cells to premiotic cells if we applied the hypoxia severely. Oxygen delays the specification. If we look at just this graph, Importantly though, here in green is what happens with nitrogen. So precocious and seemingly extra, but it tops out at the same point as control or the oxygen treatment. So the process is self-regulating. You end up at the same point, even if you're delayed by adding oxygen. And the key event here is the archosporial cell specification. They act through this MAC1 small molecule on these subepidermal L2D cells, converting them to primary parietal cells. Those cells then undergo the periclinal division that sets up the two somatic cell types. Okay, so this um, ontogeny was very satisfying in terms of an explanation, but we had still many, many questions about MAC1. So we knew from experiments I'm not showing that it's a secreted protein, it's processed to a smaller form and things like that. But a lot of things we couldn't determine, for example, when archosporial cells secrete this protein, does it act globally or does it act locally? 
so in plant biology, we're often thinking of hormones, say, in the vasculature, and then they arrive someplace and they influence a lot of cells. It's important to keep in mind that these anther lobes have no meristem. There is no organizing center. So this small molecule being secreted by a newly specified cell could be a type of organizing center, a type of organizing molecule. So all of these questions sort of haunted us. And the way that we solved it, at least in part, was to convert a pathogen we've worked with called Ustilagomatus. It's a fungal pathogen that's a biotroph. It doesn't kill or even enter maize cells. So when it hits a maize cell, it causes the plasma membrane of the maize cell to invaginate so that the fungal hypha is inside this uh, apoplastic space. And we engineered uh, Ustilago to secrete the MAC1 protein under a Ustilago promoter that acts on the second and third day after infection. So that was enough time for the fungus to get subepidermally and be in contact with those L2D cells. So the important experiment was to, to apply this special strain, which we call a Trojan horse, because it's delivering a secret package, the MAC1 protein to the uh, walls, the apoplastic space of the plant was to ask what happens in a MAC1 mutant. So this is a schematic. It's actually a tracing of a confocal image of what a fertile anther looks like at this stage. There's archosporial cells, there's subepidermal cells, and then there's the epidermis. And over here in MAC1, there's epidermis and subepidermal cells and archosporial cells, but we've colored them differently because there's just one layer and, and here there's two layers because the periclinal division has occurred. Now when we infect with a control strain of Ustilago that has no cargo um, other than a fluorescent protein, we can track the hyphae inside maize and these arrows point to regions that have that biotrophic interface. And what's nifty about the biotrophic interface is it's approximately the same width as the space between a typical archosporial cell and its uh, putative somatic neighbor. So we're kind of recreating the distance that the protein would have to travel. Here's the Trojan horse strain. It makes a similar number of biotrophic interfaces. And we could find in the fungi both the as made from the gene and the process secreted form of the protein. And the most most important assay was how often are there additional cells that are um, penetrated by the L2D cell that then, or where the fungal hyphae have made this intimate association that have gone undergone the periclinal division. And in the control strain, it's really low, under 10%. But when you have the Trojan horse, it's about 60%. So way more than half of the penetrated cells that received the MAC1 protein underwent the periclinal division, but no neighbor cell ever did it. So it means that the MAC1 signal is cell autonomous. It's secreted by an archosporial cell and it has to act on a recipient cell. Presumably there's a receptor and we later cloned the receptor. It's a homologue of the rice MSP1 receptor. Um, and there's no signaling between these L2D cells that say, oh, I saw MAC1, so you should do this. You're my neighbor. Each cell needs to get the signal separately. Now, in addition to defining this positive signal, we also defined a, a repressive signal. It's uh, controlled by an epidermal transcription factor called OCL4, and it makes a mobile signal and we'll learn more about what the identity of that might be later in the seminar. And it suppresses extra subepidermal, i.e. endothecial periclinal divisions. So in the OCL4 mutant, instead of having just one layer of subepidermal endothecial cells, you have two layers in half of the um, sphere, you might say, of the lobe. It's the outer, like the northern hemisphere, basically. In the MAC1 mutant, 
when it's just MAC1, you have lots and lots of extra archosporial cells because the soma isn't specified and it basically stops dividing. So the central space as the anther grows just fills with premiotic cells. When you make the double mutant, the subepidermal cells in the absence of whatever OCL4 does <coughs> undergo a periclinal division. So there's uh, two controls of this really important setup of the soma. One is an activating signal, the MAC1 ligand, and the other is a repressive signal. And that's become a common theme in, in developmental biology. If you apply the gas and get more of something, you also need to have breaks and make sure that you can stop it in time. So this is a review slide now. So if there was going to be an exam, I would hear all the four color pens in the room click. Um, summarizing what we've learned. So we initiate archosporial specification by hypoxia, which is naturally imposed by the way that corn grows. And it acts through MISCA1, a glutaridoxin. In the MISCA1 mutant, no archosporial cells are specified. Okay, once the AR are there, shown in purple, they secrete MAC1 and they convert their neighbor L2D cells one at a time to primary parietal cells. And the job of those PPC cells is to divide periclinally to make the secondary parietal layer and the endothesium. And then OCL4 acts from the epidermis to prevent these green cells from dividing periclinally again. So that's a good review. I hope you're up to date now about mesanthers. <laughs> It turns out OCL4 has another job, and that is it controls the production of 21 nucleotide FASI RNAs. These FASI RNAs, the biogenesis factors, are localized in the epidermis exactly where the OCL4 transcription factor localizes. Um, but the FASI RNAs are small, and they accumulate throughout the soma of the anther lobe. They could be the mobile signal that suppresses periclinal division. We don't know that for sure, but that's our working hypothesis. So before sort of talking more about that hypothesis, I think I need to tell you a bit what FASI RNAs are. So we discovered these in 2006, uh, working with uh, Sundar's lab at UC Davis. He was working on rice. We were working on corn. And Lou Bowman came from uh, Clemson University to do uh, some work in my lab. And he was an expert on small RNA and kind of boom, we had all these small RNAs. We were so mystified by them, we didn't publish for three years. So, I mean, for graduate students, don't despair. <laughs> like when you don't, if you don't understand something, sometimes it's better to wait. Anyway, we waited for a few years and then we published. And the, the reason that these small RNAs were mysterious I know, recall that the Carrington lab and others had by then found TASI RNAs, transacting, small interfering RNAs. And of course, that kind of a forest of, of different small interfering RNAs, particularly in plants. The hallmark of each and every one of those is it had an mRNA target. Our problem is the FASI RNAs have no targets that you can identify in the transcriptome. So they do not match a messenger RNA. They have some other function. And just to confess now, that's still the state of the art, although we have some guesses about what they might be doing. OK, so now you'll want to know how to make one of these. So for those of you who are familiar with the biogenesis of transacting silencing RNAs, the, the sort of steps are really similar but there's different players. So for the 21 nucleotide FASIs in maize, there's approximately 440 different loci, and they make a long non-coding RNA that gets capped and polyadenylated just like an mRNA. This molecule is then bound by an argonaut, an argonaut 1, that's carrying a microRNA called 2118. And we just... Um, discovered, and it's unpublished and likely to be unpublished for a while, that th this complex is actually bound to a ribosome, bound to ribosomes, I should say, polysomes. 
and that almost all of the FAS loci contain short ORFs. So the short ORF ensures loading onto the ribosome. So it does act, you might say, like a messenger RNA. We have yet to find any of the peptide, predicted peptides though. So we're not sure if they're translated or they could have a very short half-life. Anyway, on the ribosome, there is cleavage by the microRNA 2118 right here, and almost simultaneous copying by uh, Arur transcriptase, RDR6, that makes the second strand of RNA. And then DICER4 uh, attaches to this double-stranded region and precisely chops it, starting at the five prime end, into 21 nucleotide double-stranded segments, only one of which is typically preserved. So that's a little bit mysterious. And these retained small RNAs are bound by AGO5C, and they constitute the 21 nucleotide FASI RNA population. Now, the 24 nucleotide FASIs have a very similar um, ontogeny, but they have a different specific microRNA. So they have a different region of complementarity than these guys to a specific microRNA. They're copied by RDR6. But then a novel dicer that's basically monocot specific, the gene duplication from dicer three dates back about 80 million years. Um, so this is uh, POA and some closely related uh, families. Um, dicer five chops it into 24 nucleotide small RNAs, and we don't yet know what argonaut binds those small RNAs. And it makes a large population of 24 nucleotide phases. So a typical precursor generates between 20 and 50 small RNAs each. And the reason that we discovered them so long ago when methods were really crude is these guys are unbelievably abundant. And they also show very distinct temporal deployment in anthers. They are anther specific in the POA and in other plants, they are at least floral specific. They might be anther specific, but people haven't dissected anthers um, to demonstrate that. So back here at 0.2 millimeter is right when the archosporial cells are being specified, and 0.4 is when the somatic cell specification has finished, and most of the cells, the primary parietal cells, have undergone the periclinal division that sets up the endothesium and the secondary parietal. And here's the 21 nucleotide FASI microRNA right here. So you can see it's made a little bit before the 0.4 stage, but it peaks here. Here's the FAS loci. So they're incredibly abundant at 0.4 from barely there. And here's the proportion of all 21 nucleotide small RNAs, including all the microRNAs that are actually FASI. So at 0.4, approximately 65% of all 21 nucleotide RNAs are FASI RNAs. And the proportion declines over time, but they're retained through mid-meiosis at reasonably abundant levels. Now for the 24 nucleotide FAS loci, there's a tiny bit of transcript production and small RNA production early, but the big bang, so to speak, of setting up the precursors and the microRNA that are required starts at one millimeter, which is the transition between archosporial cells and pollen mother cells, if you're tracking the germinal cells. And it's also, uh, as I'll point out in more detail later, a time when the tapetum redifferentiates. And then peak abundance of the 24 nucleotide phases occurs at two millimeters, which is late prophase one towards the end, could be the end of meiosis one, when they're close to 70% of all the 24 nucleotide small RNAs. So these guys uh, were easy to find, even with crude methods, if you dissected anthers at the right stage. And the amount of them is millions of copies per cell. So we're talking about a huge amount of small RNA. We also always track 
other types of um, small RNA, those um, repressors of transposons and TAS3 um, type small RNAs. Okay, so in addition to temporal separation of now what are two classes of small RNA, fuzzy RNAs, there's also spatial separation. So I've already mentioned that the epidermis and specifically dependent on the OCL4 transcription factor, which is preferentially ex expressed kind of at the North Pole, sort of a, a limited arc here on the outer part of each lobe. That's where the microRNA 2118 predominant, predominates and also the precursor transcripts, 21 FAS, although they're sort of found elsewhere, including what we think is artifactual hybridization to the um, archosporeal cells. Dicer 4, the required cleaving enzyme, is also pretty widely distributed. And for sure, the product, the 21 nucleotide fasces, are widely distributed in the anthers. We think this and other evidence that I'm not sharing means that the 21 FAS RNAs are mobile. We think they start here and they're spreading um, into the rest of the soma. Now, what about the 24 nucleotide fasces? We're looking at an older anther now, and the required microRNA for cleaving the precursor is highly enriched in the tapetum, as are the 24 nucleotide fas loci, as is Dicer 5, the required processing enzyme, as are the 24 nucleotide small RNAs. So I know there's one report here from Cornell, from Wojtek's lab, and one from Japan, I think, that uh, has evidence that the uh, now um, pollen mother cells or myocytes contain 24 nucleotide fuzzy RNAs, potentially at a low level. But we find, unfortunately, that any in situ probe we put on, especially this stage of anthers, sticks to the callus coat that surrounds the myocytes. So that's very unsatisfying in terms of knowing whether it's true or not. And then in a separate study that I'm not talking about today, a postdoc in the lab has purified uh, archosporeal cells, PMC and myocytes for single RNA-seq and finds neither the FAS precursors nor Dicer 5 in those cells. So it remains an open question. If the fuzzy RNAs are there, they're probably imported from the tapetum rather than made in situ. And then finally, in addition to spatio-temporal separation, the two classes of fuzzy RNAs are independently regulated genetically. So I've already pointed out that OCL4 is required to make the 21 nucleotide fuzzies, and the microRNA levels are greatly reduced. The fuzzies are virtually gone, and almost all the precursors are gone. But the pattern of 24 nucleotide fuzzy biogenesis is basically normal. And the opposite is true for MISCA1, which basically never gets started, so it doesn't have a tapetum. MAC1 lacks a tapetum, and MS23 has a very defective tapetum. They're all making the 21 nucleotide fuzzy RNAs, which are characteristic of very early stages, but they're failing to make the 24 nucleotide fuzzies. The microRNA uh, 2275 is made in MS23 mutants, but it's from a different locus, two different loci than is represented over here. So there's activation of alternative loci, but there's no precursor to process, so there's basically no fuzzies produced. And amyotic 1, which is a mutant that fails to do a correct meiosis, it does mitosis instead of meiosis in these pollen mother cells. It has both relatively normal 21 and 24 nucleotide uh, RNAs, suggesting that they're not like stimulators of, of meiosis. Okay, so it may have crossed your mind since I'm a maze geneticist and we tend to be kind of narrow-minded that maybe we found something that's absolutely maze-specific. We used to, my seminar at this point used to talk about POA and how special the grasses were, et cetera. But a couple of smart students in like Myers lab, our collaborators, 
decided to check uh, non-grass monocots, and a paper has just come out in genome for asparagus lily, daylily, and some other non-grass monocots. They all have reproductive fasci RNAs. There also, another person in Blake's lab found they're, they're present sporadically in different families of dicots. He was an expert on lychee, like who would go choose that tree to do the work? It turns out it's easy to get anthers, and sure enough, the reproductive fasces were there. And that was followed by collaborators who supplied strawberry, tomato, and a whole lot of other dicot anthers. And um, sorry to report the one family where there's zip is the Brassicaceae. So Arabidopsis is not a model for this. And there's some other major families where they're extremely rare. And then another uh, place where we should think about these male specific reproductive small RNAs are the pi RNAs that are found in mammalian testes. So these are absolutely required for successful sperm production. Interestingly, just like plants, there's two size classes. One is made before meiosis, one is made during meiosis, but not in the germinal cells, it's in the supporting cells. There are no known functions because they don't match messenger RNAs. So it looks like convergent evolution to aid male reproduction in the mammals and the flowering plants, something I find very odd. What is also interesting is we've worked out the biogenesis mechanisms in the, in the Poaceae, and there's different biogenesis mechanisms in the non-grass monocots and in the dicots and in the mammalian pi RNAs. So although you end up with the same types of small RNA products, super abundant at very specific times in male reproduction, they're not made in exactly the same way. Okay. Now I'd like to talk in more detail about the 24 nucleotide fasces and something about the tapetum. So tapetum is, um, oops, now it's working. Isn't that weird? Oop, now it's really bad, sorry. You're good with integrating tiny, okay. Um, for tapetal cell development, we've demonstrated that it's controlled by a cascade of basic helix loop helix transcription factors, starting with the master regulator, uh, male sterile 23, which acts actually in the secondary parietal cells and is important for uh, achieving the correct uh, periclinal division and steps after that. Now, what's underappreciated is that Tapetal cells are born and perform a suite of functions. And then during meiosis, they have to redifferentiate. So they're differentiated before meiosis to do one set of jobs. Then they redifferentiate for functions late in meiosis and add even more functions to support gametophytes. And all of this cell redifferentiation seems to require the 24 nucleotide fasci RNAs. And starting with MS23, is the master regulator of the tapetum, and also is the master regulator of 24 nucleotide fasci RNA biogenesis. And it acts in part through regulating these other BHLHs. So the production of the correct microRNA, the precursors, the dicer, all depend on MS23. Now, among these various players, Many of them are redundant or partially redundant. So there's four loci encoding, encoding microRNA 2275, for example. They have a lot of different argonauts, et cetera. The only thing that was a single copy gene was Dicer 5. And so we decided to use CRISPR-Cas9 to mutate this singular gene and find out what would happen um, to development uh, of the anther. So it's a honking big gene, and uh, we recovered numerous mutants. And for those not working on maize, uh, what's really great about maize is when we do the transformation, it's of a single cell of an embryo in culture, and it appears that the CRISPR-Cas9 system acts in that cell. So more than 95% of the plants that are regenerated are biallelic. They have mutations in both alleles, independent mutations. 
And so it's easy to recover lots of different alleles. And we've characterized carefully four of those alleles. And thank goodness for this, even in the T0, those first initial plants, the Dicer 5 plants are male sterile. And I mean clear male sterility. This is what a tassel looks like that has anthers out. This is a heterozygote of the Dicer 5-1 allele with the wild type. This is a homozygote Dicer 5-1. And so at the stage when lots of anthers are out on this tassel, there's nothing out in this tassel. And Dicer 5 is absolutely required to produce the 24 nucleotide fazi RNAs. And I'll show you that data in a sec. And in all of our early studies, the mutations in Dicer 5 conferred male sterility under field or greenhouse conditions. And it was from tapetal redifferentiation failure. So during the tapetal cells are there, and they've done some measurable functions normally, but they fail to redifferentiate as secretory cells during meiosis. So here's the demonstration that the 24 nucleotide fases, which are extremely abundant at 1.5 and even more abundant at two millimeters, are almost completely gone in the mutants. I have to tell you that there's a couple of the FAS loci that slightly overlap with protein coding genes. And so in the severe mutants, basically what you're seeing is some small RNA production from the protein coding genes. This is a 12 um, nucleotide deletion, so four amino acids, and it's a very low function uh, allele. And also important, the Dicer 5 mutation, as expected, selectively blocks accumulation of 24 nucleotide fases and doesn't influence the 21 nucleotide fase class. It doesn't in influence other types of 24 nucleotide small RNA. So basically only orange is super depressed or missing and the other types of small RNA are normal. And again, I'm not showing you all the data for this, but in these mutants, the FAS precursors accumulate. So the loci, in this case about 170 loci, are still copiously transcribed. And those mRNA-like molecules accumulate because there is no processing. And that's what you'd expect for a precursor product relationship. OK, so obviously, we love to look at anthers with a microscope. And in looking at the Dicer 5 mutant at key stages uh, from the somatic specification stage through uh, pollen mother cell and stages of meiosis, the architecture, that is the cellular anatomy, was indistinguishable between the Dicer 5 mutant and controls. So we could not find any defect in the pace or pattern of cell division in the size of the cells, in the number of cells, just seemed the same. And we're not experts at uh, meiosis, but um, this was done by Han Zhang, who was um, a graduate student in Kelly Daw's lab, where she did learn how to do all the meiotic staging. And again, meiosis appeared to be completely normal in the Dicer 5 mutant. So we're looking at a male sterile, and we're wondering, like, what the heck is wrong with these plants? Why, why are they male sterile? So we need to kind of return to what goes on in the tapetum from birth into some of its specific jobs. So in a, an anther at about 550 microns, each lobe has 600 secondary parietal cells. And if you label with EDU, which is a, a T analog, it's incorporated into DNA. It's non-toxic. It's a really great label. And then later, you use clicket chemistry to attach a fluorescent label to the EDU molecules that have been incorporated into DNA. So the secondary parietal layer is basically these green dots. That's one lobe. Here's another lobe. So approximately half of the secondary parietal cells will label in a two-hour EDU incubation. So they're not synchronous, but they're at this stage, lots of the cells are getting ready to do that very important periclinal division that makes the tapetum and middle layer. And in fact, if you chart that, 
you see that the division, at least in the inbred we use, is completely symmetric. So the final volume of the two cell types and, and each of their dimensions are identical. So it's a periclinal division that's perfect in the, is the term used in the literature. It makes two equivalent cells. Okay, so now we've, we've made the, tip, the tapetal cells back here. And their first key job after some, a period of rapid proliferation for a couple of days is they secrete the calase that remodels the callos that's been secreted by the pollen mother cells. So the pollen mother cells secrete excess callos. It's kind of lumpy and weird looking. And the callase causes it to be a smooth coat that encases each pollen mother cell in a shell, kind of like an M&M. &M. <coughs> then during meiosis, the tapetal cells begin to synthesize the components of the exine. So those are the sporophytic compounds that end up being placed on pollen as it develops. Weirdly, the tapetal cells also become binucleate, which is a feature in almost all angiosperms that has no explanation. Why not just be polyploid? No, they've got to have two nuclei. And they also remodel the wall that faces the developing um, myocytes and subsequent um, microgametophytes. And this wall remodeling is extremely important for secretion because at the end of meiosis, they begin to secrete these things that they've been making. And they do that through this super elaborate plasma membrane that perforates a wall that's now mostly dissolved. And then they do one last thing for the anther. About five days later, a few days later, they die, program cell death. And the, the collapse of the remaining tapetal wall makes something that we call biological Velcro. So each developing microgametophyte, oops, sorry about that. Each developing microgametophyte needs to find a place on this biological Velcro. So this is found in about 10% of angiosperms where the microgametophytes need to attach to the dead tapetal wall. It's kind of like musical chairs. If you don't find a spot, if you're left in here, you stop developing. So it's an absolute requirement to get viable pollen that each and every one of these microgametophytes get to one of these tapetal landing pads. So you can see, or I hope I've convinced you, that the tapetum isn't just one thing. Like to say it's a nutritive layer kind of overlooks it, the sequential jobs that it performs. This gave us a lot of characters that we could use to judge what's wrong in those Dicer-5 mutants. So by transmission EM, here's wild type, we see that the tapetal cells have two nuclei. We could see nuclei typically, and they're really dark staining. They're filled with uh, exine components, whereas the Dicer-5 mutants are very pale. They're not making exine. And then uh, also very clear, this is a special kind of um, microscopy analysis called 3D segmentation, where yellow represents binucleate cells and purple mononucleate. There's a lot more binucleate cells uh, at various stages, one and a half or 2.5 millimeter in wild type than in the mutant. So it appears that the Dicer-5 mutant tapetal cells are failing to redifferentiate in a timely fashion. Some make it, some make binucleate cells, which is one of the last steps. They might be accumulating a small amount of exine, but they're not normal. And so they're either delayed or arrested in some aspect of their developmental program. And then we did one more experiment, always the killer. So we were writing all of this up and we said, well, you know, we always grow everything under really hot conditions. It's corn after all. Let's do a low temperature experiment and see what happens. Well, the big surprise is that the Dicer-5 mutants are restored to partial or even full fertility when grown under cool conditions. So I need to tell you that we were 
growing under what's considered optimal corn yield conditions. There's huge historical data that says you get maximum corn yield with 28 to 29 centigrade days and 22 degree centigrade nights. For us, these are restrictive conditions. You absolutely require Dicer 5 to be present. If you go under cool growing conditions, Dicer 5 is dispensable. So here's mutant pollen from the cool growing conditions. Here's the control pollen. Pollen is fine. We, can, we have self-pollinated. You can also see it. Here's in warm growing conditions, night and day. Here's the period of meiosis when we made sure that the temperature was really high. And we can get sterile plants. If we lower the temperature to 26 or 23, we get fertility, at least partial fertility. Now, it turns out that the cool growing conditions do not restore the 24 nucleotide phases. So Dicer 5 is not being made under cool conditions. Something else is going on. Not only that, but the ancient duplication parent gene, Dicer 3, which is found in all flowering plants, can't substitute for Dicer 5 in making the 24 nucleotide phases. So what's dispensable are the phase RNAs, not just Dicer 5. You don't need phase RNAs for fertility if you grow the plants in unusually cool conditions. And we did a long series of temperature shift experiments in three-day increments. This is a very complicated slide. The orange area is the period of meiosis. And we were shifting plants between 21 or 23 degrees and 28, um, and then back again. And it turns out that I need to tell you that a developing maize tassel has about seven days worth of anther development. And so to get a fully fertile tassel where all of the anthers come out, you need our nine-day treatment, six or nine-day treatment. But for any given cohort of anthers that are of a similar stage, you only need three days, maybe less. So there's a, a phenocritical period during meiosis, during the period when the tapetal cells begin their redifferentiation, when they either need the FASI24 nucleotide RNAs, or they need cool conditions. Now, what else does cool conditions do? It really slows down development. So meiosis is now going to take 12 or 13 days instead of six or seven. And that also means the tapetal cells have a lot longer time to do whatever they need to do to redifferentiate. Okay. So let's get to the conclusions here. So what can we say about whether 21 nucleotide FASI RNAs are required for maize anther development? Um, when we eliminate them genetically, and now we've eliminated them by mutating microRNA 2118, we fail to get normal somatic development, and this causes male sterility. So we can say it's plausible that the mobile signal under the control of OCL4 is in fact the FASI RNAs. And that's the hypothesis that we're trying to test now. This green arrow points to the part of each anther lobe that is, seems to be the, the most important area for the expression of OCL4 for microRNA2118 and some of the other biogenesis factors. Although there's no meristem, maybe this is a kind of signaling center in that you get information from here and it spreads through the lobe and helps organize the development of the soma. What about the 24 nucleotide RNAs? So if we eliminate Dicer 5 under normal growing conditions and hence eliminate the 24 nucleotide FASI RNAs, we get male sterility. But it seems to be not sterility from some defect in meiosis, but from this important tapetal cell redifferentiation, which seems contingent under normal growing conditions on the presence of the 24 nucleotide phases. So we're kind of left with a hypothesis that in some way, 24 nucleotide phase RNAs aid 
rapid reorganization of tapetal cells. So under normal growing conditions, the tapetal cells need to do things bang, bang, bang over a day, two, maybe three, and that that is helped by having 24 nucleotide fatty RNAs present. But if you slow everything down, then more or less successfully, the tapetal cells can reorganize themselves using a different pathway. Now, this leads exactly into my last slide, which is, we have yet to pop the cork on this champagne because, of course, the most important thing to figure out is what are the functions, the exact functions of these small RNAs. So they could be acting in some unexpected way as signals for cell fate and differentiation. I mean, there's many, many examples of individual microRNAs acting at, at critical junctures to guide or program uh, differentiation. Why would you need 440 21 nucleotide loci? Why 170 that make 24 nucleotide fasces? So if they're signals, they're individually pretty crummy at it. You need zillions of them. They could have cytoplasmic or nuclear roles or both. We're pretty convinced now they're made in the cytoplasm, but they're not probably restricted to that compartment. And then our sort of current working model, um, I've nicknamed the FLAC hypothesis. So this has also um, been suggested by some people that work on mammalian pi RNAs. If you accept that small RNA metabolism is critical for cell differentiation, then disrupting it by putting out a huge number of non-functional small RNAs could disrupt everything about small RNA control. So it might allow for making a clean slate, like when a cell needs to change from one state to another, like from a primary parietal cell to an endothelial and secondary parietal cell, or when the tapetal cells need to redifferentiate. If you don't have them, maybe there's a workaround like the decay of the fazi RNAs and eventually the regular systems take over and microRNAs can do their normal job. Anyway, I realize that's not a super satisfying final hypothesis, but it's what we're working on now with uh, new methods to knock out not just one or two FAS loci, but dozens if not hundreds at a time. Okay, and then it wouldn't be a good seminar if I didn't acknowledge the people who actually did the work. So in my lab, um, there's a number of postdoctoral fellows who have contributed to this, plus uh, John Fernandez, a uh, bioinformatician, and then former members of the lab, like Karina van der Linde developed the Trojan horse, various other people worked on aspects of the talk I gave today. And for the past five years and now continuing for four more, we're generously supported by the NSF in a collaboration with Blake Myers Lab. He's expert, his lab is expert on small RNA uh, sequencing and analysis. So I have to say we do a lot of the biology, they do all the sequencing and together we try to figure out what's going on in maize anthers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we're a little short on time. Let's maybe just take two questions, and then if you have more questions afterwards, you can come talk to me afterwards. Wait, oh, go ahead. So, Jane, in a DCL, in the DCL5 mutant, is the tapetal cell re-differentiation re still defective? Oh, yeah. Or the, the fertile despite? Well, no, they, uh, they kind of catch up with everything. It just takes a really long time because the exine is formed on the pollen. Like all the things that you would expect to come from the tapetum eventually happen. But actually pollen shed, even if it's only like a six day period in cool weather, it'll be, pollen shed will be 10 days later than normal. So you've really extended developmental time. Anyway. There seem like a lot of parallels between the pi RNAs in mammals and, and bees, including the synthesis from clusters and yeah. the fact that factors needed for biogenesis are leading to male sterility. Right. I'm, I'm wondering if in the DCL5 mutants, when you have reactivation of mobile elements, loss of DNA methylation? Well, on the first, I can say for sure there appears to be no reactivation of transposons. This is true for 
the Drosophila pies, and for a subset, about 10% of the mammalian pie RNAs are, well, are associated with some homology to some transposons. We seem not to have that at all. And then on the DNA methylation front, we have what I would say is ambiguous data on whole anthers. And so a postdoc now is doing laser micro dissection of tapetal cells, since that seems to be where the action is, to ask if the fazi 24s can influence the level of methylation. I, I think it's gonna be technically challenging because the, the binucleate status requires one round of DNA synthesis. And so there's actually, you know, it's not just one nucleus in one cell. What if there's like an old nucleus and a new one, you might say? Like where the, if you were hemimethylated at the beginning, maybe you have one cell that retains hemimethylation and one that's unmethylated because it got the unmethylated. So I'm guessing that this is not gonna be easy like to be really definitive on, but it's her favorite theory <clears throat> because classically, 24 nucleotide small RNAs in plants are involved in the RNA directed DNA methylation pathway. And so it would be something that, you know, a lot more is known about the, from the non FASI 24 nucleotide class. But I think pinning it down here is, is going to be tricky. The, the, at the time when it matters, about 40%, not quite 40% of all the nuclei in an anther are actually from the tapetum. That's why we have what I would call hint of success results on whole anthers, but not really satisfying. I think we need the purified cells. Thanks. I think we're out of time. Um, so oh. for the grad students, uh, please remember there's lunch in G22. Um, and let's thank the speaker again. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.